بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. So good afternoon. Uh, my name is Asad Tarsin. I um, I think this is. Bad. I am going to uh, present to you a brief, uh, sort of five-minute explanation of probably ten, I think, and then and then we'll get into a bit more of the uh, very foundations of Islam. So this is going to be a brief overview. So I'm challenged with summarizing an entire religion, its civilization, its teachings, <laughs> short amount of time. Should be easy, right? Uh, and there will be a quiz at the end, so play, pay close attention. So I'm going to start with definitions. Um, the first is the word Islam. What does Islam mean? So taken uh, as a term in the, Engl in, in the Arabic language, if you were to look it up, Islam is a term that means to turn oneself over to or to surrender or resign oneself to. Being a Semitic language, the Arabic language that is, there is a cognate root and so it shares the same root as words such as peace or wholeness. Uh, but it's the proper name of the religion itself. Parallel to that is the term Muslim. So a Muslim is the title for somebody who follows the religion of Islam. Uh, it is, uh, let's jump in ahead just a little bit here. Technology works with you and against you sometimes. So uh, a Muslim is one who surrenders to God and uh, by doing so is able to attain a peace within themselves, a wholeness spiritually by surrendering to God. So when we surrender ourselves to God, we thereby attain an inner serenity and wholeness. So a Muslim can be from any walk of life, any ethnicity, any background. Um, it is not particular to any part of the world. Um, once it starts to behave, I will share with you a couple pictures and, and hopefully highlight that. So who are, who's that right there? We got a couple of faces. Are you guys able to make those out? Kat Stevens, Muhammad Ali, Dr. Oz, people very different ethnicities, very different walks of life, all share the fact that they uh, follow the religion of Islam, so they would be called Muslims, even though um, none of them are Arab or Indian or Pakistani, but from different uh, ethnicities. The third definition uh, that I'd like to cover is the term that you might hear often, which is Allah. Allah is simply the Arabic name for God. It's actually used by Arabic-speaking Jews and Christians as well. In fact, this right here, this image I have, is from an Arabic copy of the Bible, and that says right there, it's, it says Genesis, um, and it says, Fil Bad'i Khalaq Allahu, right? Allah, right? Created in the beginning, Allah created the heavens and the earth. Um, so there you have what is very common in all of the churches in the Middle East that are Arabic speaking, that they use Allah in their churches as well. So it's not a specific God, but it's the God of Abraham. Uh, it's, and we believe it's a God who sent Noah and Isaac and Jesus, etc. It's all the same, Allah, and it's not a different. It's it's a different language, um, and a different name, but referring to the same uh, deity. So, what we believe as Muslims is that God sent an entire succession of prophets. We don't believe that religion began with the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Uh, we believe that all of God's prophets were sent in a succession, and they all had a purpose, and they all helped to build towards the culmination of the message. Uh, Islam doesn't see itself as something new, but as a completion and a restoration of previous messages sent by God. So, for example, we hold that all of God's prophets were in a state of submission to God. And so Muslims will sometimes say Islam with a lowercase i. Because if we think of Noah building the ark and obeying God's commands to do so, he was in a state of surrender to God. And so in that sense, he was in a state of Islam, even though he wasn't following the religion Islam, which gets revealed several uh, millennia later. There's a famous tradition from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that I think summarizes all of this beautifully. Uh, he says that God's message to humanity is like a large, beautiful building that's been built. And people are walking around and admiring the beauty of the building. And they say, what a wondrous structure, except it's just missing that one brick. And he says, I am that final brick. 
And so he sees himself as building upon what his brethren from the previous dispensations brought, and not someone who comes to replace, but rather to complete and to restore. And so part of the Muslim tradition is that God has sent over 124,000 prophets to humanity. We don't know them all. There are 25 that we know named in the Quran, and these are the household names when we talk about Noah and Moses and Isaac and Ishmael, and we, we name these names. But we don't know who else God sent. God sent many. Uh, he, we are told in the Quran that he did not leave a people except with someone who told them to worship God. Um, and history sort of holds up to this. Every culture has a belief in a one great divine behind the creation of the universe. So whether it's a Native American tribe or the aboriginals in, in, in uh, Australia, we would believe that some form of God's message reached them and that he would not have left them without a basic teaching. So there are three dimensions to the religion. And this all begins with, uh, is best told by a story. There's a famous event in the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, where he is sitting before the Kaaba, which is the sacred house in Mecca. How many of you have seen a picture of the sacred house? Large black cubic structure. So that was actually built by Abraham, and it's there in the Bible. It's Becca with a B instead of Mecca with an M. The B and the M are cognates in, in the Semitic language, right? In Becca, he and Ishmael build this temple to, the, uh, to worship the one creator. Um, and of course, as time goes on, it becomes overridden with polytheism and idols um, until the coming of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But one day, he's sitting with his companions, and a man uh, comes to him, and this is a stranger, none of his companions uh, know of the, who this person is, but he asks him a series of questions, and these questions become, the answers to them become what we call the three dimensions of the religion. So these three dimensions are what the quiz will be on. All right, just, just, just giving good hints here. All right. So the first, and they can be summarized in faith, conduct, and character. These are the three basic building blocks of the faith. It's faith, conduct, and character. So the first are actions to be, form, to be performed. Our conduct has a basic set of devotions to God that serve as the basis for all other conduct in life. So the, this is what is famously called the five pillars of Islam. Have, has anybody here heard that phrase before? So those are the, only the pillars of conduct. We still have faith and we have character. But, um, so the first is the two testimonies of faith. This is the means by which a person uh, formally becomes a Muslim. You simply testify and believe that there's nothing worthy of worship save God and that Muhammad is the final messenger um, in this long succession that includes Jesus and Moses and Abraham, etc. Um, and anybody who utters these two phrases, these two statements, is by definition a, a Muslim. Uh, once a person considers themselves a Muslim, they have to perform five daily prayers. These are devotions that serve as the foundation of our, of our relationship with God. So at five different points throughout the day based on the position of the sun. There's one that's right at the crack of dawn. There's one right as the sun moves past its zenith. There's one right as uh, sort of in the afternoon, one just after sunset, and one uh, when it's complete night. Um, and at that, those five points in the prayer, uh, we wash in a particular way, ablution, uh, and we face the house built by Abraham, and we pray to God. Uh, we also pay what's called a purifying charity, or a poor tax. Every Muslim who's above a certain poverty line is to give two and a half percent, one fortieth of uh, our savings. So if you have unused wealth, which you know m many of us don't sometimes, and that's fine. But if you have wealth that stays over from year to year unused, that's considered surplus beyond your needs, and one fortieth of that should be distributed to the poor and the needy. Um, that's a minimum. Uh, and then fasting the month of of Ramadan. This is a month. Uh, it's a lunar month, so it kind of moves throughout the year. Uh, it currently is about like Mayish, um, and this is from dawn until sunset. We abstain from food, uh, drink, and intimacy. These are the three most basic desires of a human being. They are part of the um, animal side, if, if, if you will, of what it means to be a human being, because we're part celestial, 
meaning our, our soul, but then we're very terrestrial. There's an animal side to us. And taming that side is part of the purification process. <coughs> the final is the pilgrimage to Mecca, um, that house that we've talked about now a couple times, built by Abraham, once in your life if you are physically and financially able. The second dimension, faith. These are not actions that we perform. Rather, these are realities that we must affirm in our hearts. The first is obvious. You have to believe in one God. Uh, Islam has what's called radical monotheism. You don't simply believe in one God. You actively negate any other divinity beside him. Um, so this is very almost Old Testament-like, that there is nothing divine other than God. Um, and we also believe that God has creatures that he's created in an unseen dimension that interact with us, angels. Uh, and then we have to affirm that God communicates with his creation through messengers. And at times, he even sends scripture with them. So there are four scriptures that, at, at minimum that Muslims must affirm. The Torah, the Psalms of David, the Gospel of Jesus, and the Quran sent to Muhammad, peace be upon him. We also have to affirm that God sends messengers, and we have to affirm particular messengers. Uh, this is a point of difference, I think, between Trinitarian Christians and Muslims, and I'm sharing this more for education's sake. <coughs> Muslims believe Jesus pr uh, closer to early Unitarian belief, so that, that Jesus, you know, you had the mono, uh, monophysites, diaphysites, you had all these debates. Muslims hold that Jesus is the awaited Messiah. He was born of a virgin birth. He will return at the end of time. They, they share all, we share all of those things, except that he was not divine. So he was uh, uh, the son of God in a metaphorical sense, meaning a holy man or one who is completely uh, in, in, in consonance with God, but not literally God the Son or God incarnate. So Muslims would hold him to be a mortal creation of God who was godly in his behavior and his mission. Uh, we also believe in a day of judgment, that we are, will all be resurrected um, to be judged before our creator and that nobody gets away with anything uh, truly in the end. Uh, and the final and sixth aspect of our divine belief, uh, uh, in our beliefs, sorry, is a belief in what's called divine decree. That nothing in the cosmos happens outside of God's direct will and guiding it. So our gathering here today, this collection of souls in this room, is something that was decreed by God before the universe was a twinkle of dust. That this is something that God, we still have free will and there's a tension between that. We have free will, but we have to work within what God decrees. So when things happen to us, we know that it couldn't have been any other way. This is what God decreed for us and that there is a great wisdom behind it. Um, there's a famous uh, poet of the Islamic tradition, Rumi, who tells a story of an ant that's crawling across a big Persian rug. Have you guys seen those, those magnificent Persian rugs? And as this ant is crawling, he says, uh, he looks down, he notices it's red suddenly, and then it just becomes green and then blue and seems very random to him. And he says, what kind of a carpet maker just has a bunch of different colors going on? And Rumi says, oh, little ant with your short sight, if only you could step out and see the magnificent design of the carpet maker, you would just stay in awe and wonder of his majesty. And that's about sort of the, the, the carpet of life. That sometimes we don't really see what's happening, and then when we're older, we look back and we say, you know, that was probably the best thing that happened to me, even if it seemed tragic at the time. Uh, the third dimension, faith, conduct, and character. All right. People are awake. I like it. Before we get into character, I've got to touch just a little bit on the Islamic view of uh, humankind, of humanity. So on the one hand, we believe that God created us with what's called a primary nature. This is our God-given nature, that every human being, if uh, left to their natural state, and I mean no trauma, people are abused and they go through difficult things, and that, that can alter it. But we have an innate knowledge of right and wrong, and we have an innate inclination towards everything that is good and true and beautiful. That there is no healthy soul that doesn't look at a sunset and say like, wow, that's amazing. And that, that natural inclination of what we go towards will eventually guide us to God. All of us have this internal compass that's pointing towards the divine. In fact, we see causation behind things 
because we know we're, we're always looking for the cause of the universe and the cause of our lives. So that's us on the one hand. On the other hand, we also have a selfish ego. We have a capacity, perhaps even a thirst, for our carnal desires and to be utterly selfish, right? This is uh, the side of us that leads to road rage, which is such a strange phenomenon. Same people are just totally calm, and in in, you know, and if you bump into them in the mall, and then they get behind the wheel, and there's just something about my lane and my speed and my destination, right? So that's, we have both of these realities to us. We're complex beings. We're composite beings. And so part of the development of character is the purification of the soul. It's a process by which we are to resist the urges of our carnal desires and our selfishness and our ego on the one hand. And then we are to augment and to embellish that primary nature. There's an aspect to children, if you see them, that can be incredibly giving. And then there's an aspect to children that when somebody touches their toy that they haven't even seen in two years, they suddenly want it, right? And so part of life is to learn to sort of trim away those aspects while enhancing and augmenting the other aspects. And when we do that, we have a purification of our souls that develops, where we will get over our anger, our jealousy, our envy, our all of these things, the contempt we have for people, the arrogance in our hearts, all of these things can be purged. And this is also attained, on the one hand, by uh, a way of engaging in the world in which we do, don't, we do not become worldly. So the world is here as our sort of the battleground of the soul. And it's a temporary place. And this was actually one of the great messages of Jesus, peace be upon him, that he came to remind us that this is just but a bridge to the afterlife. And you don't make this your permanent home. And if you do you sort of have lost a, a certain vision of the reality of life, right? That this is a fleeting world. And if you use it right, you can attain eternal salvation and an enlightened soul. Um, but if used for selfish desires, uh, uh, it, it, it will bring you to peril. As one Muslim sage put it, it's to have the world in your hand, but not in your heart. And... At the end of this story, so this, this is a, a series of three questions that was asked to the Prophet Muhammad. What is, uh, what is Islam, which is the, uh, the pillars of conduct? What is faith? And then what is spiritual beauty? And he answers uh, with those three sets of, of, of teachings. And at the end, this man who's asking the questions, he leaves. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he turns to his companions and he says, do you all know who that was? And they said, no, we've never, we don't know who that is. We've never seen him. And the Prophet Muhammad responds, that was Gabriel. He came to teach you your religion. So this phrase is why uh, in Muslim teaching, this has become the great summary of faith. That any faith that has, that has uh, conduct that focuses on the external, like the law, without the spirit, will be imbalanced. If we focus on spirit without law, there's an imbalance. If we're all faith and there's no need for, for works, that's an imbalance. So all three have to harmonize in order to have a complete expression of the religion. <coughs> so again, just to recap here, Islam sees itself as a culmination of previous religions. Uh, if one surrenders to God, one can attain peace and harmony within themselves within their homes, within their communities, and eventually with the world. Um, and Islam sees itself, this phrase, the middle road, actually comes from the Qur'an, uh, the holy book of the Muslims. Muslims see themselves as a middle road in which they merge the rich legal teachings of the Torah and the higher spiritual calling of the gospel. So again, uh, faith, conduct, and character. And if you notice here, there is a, a, a body component with our acts. There is the mind, that which we believe and conceive. And then there is the soul. So it is a mind, body, soul surrender to God that is complete. And to do any two without the third or any one without the other two, um, again, results in imbalance. So these are the three core teachings of the religion. Uh, thank you for listening and look forward to some questions. I don't want to
Hi, so my task today is to uh, contribute to some of the myth busting by addressing uh, jihad and ISIS, what it is and what it is not. But before I do that, I think I want to share with you a bit about my personal journey because it relates to the subject matter. So I grew up here in the Bay Area and throughout my years growing up here and at the U.S. Naval Academy where I went, you know, like most Americans, I was ignorant of what Islam is. And uh, particularly being in the military, the Muslims were generally seen as the enemy or the other. So Islam at face value 25 years ago was a very distant concept and something that I did not think I would ever embrace. There you go. I put the sailing thing up because I was on the offshore sailing team and I saw those pictures. I was like, I sailed on that boat brave. <laughs> so, anyways. And Navy lost today to Notre Dame, so just I'm I'm kind of off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it would have been good if we beat them. Okay, anyways. okay so but my, my at my freshman year at the Naval Academy, uh, I remember I was given an assignment. It was to summarize the biographies of the most eminent scientists, philosophers, and mathematicians of the Western civilization. And I remember being in the library, and I was flipping through the pages of these thick books, and about to fall asleep. And I read this passage, and it literally jarred me. And effectively, the passage described how some of the most renowned you know, mathematicians and scientists uh, in the Western civilization were all believers in a transcendental or a universal, which is an academically neutral term for a god. So that really shook me because I was never told that, that the most eminent scientists and philosophers and mathematicians that we all know, Rene Descartes, Isaac Newton, all of them, were trying to understand the created universe. So public high school doesn't teach our children that, that that was their primary motive. So it was really fascinating. So from that point on, it launched me on a quest uh, throughout my remaining days at Annapolis and then subsequently why it was in the Navy to continue to read and study and debate and search out answers to the concept of God and religion. And throughout this quest, I developed a list of criteria, whether it was um, philosophical or social or scientific, certain standards that I would uh, establish uh, and I went kind of shopping as I went around the world in the Navy and uh, learning about different religions and which one made sense. And none of them really made sense. For example, in the, in the category of science, I believe that, that scientific discovery can only serve to validate revelation. That it would be inappropriate for scientific discovery to debunk a religious tenet. Because after all, we're talking about the created universe and God should know it all. So, so... Uh, Islam did that for me. There were a number of scientific stuff in the Quran that was written 1400 years ago that it could not have been written or known by an illiterate desert Bedouin prophet who never saw the ocean, for example, and all these mysteries of the ocean and scientific stuff that we're discovering now. So anyways, all of those, it, it ticked off all of those things for me. It, but in particular, out, being a, a naval officer, I was really interested in um, the just war concept because uh, you know, war is perhaps the most brutal, sanctioned human acts that we can engage in. And if you don't apply a certain moral code to your conduct during armed conflict, it would literally drive a person crazy. So PTSD, all of these symptoms and elements that we see in our veterans, in some measure has to do with uh, engaging in brutality without a certain code of conduct. So... Um, so what, what's broadly referred to today as, as the, the just war concept. And in, in researching, uh, you know, the major world religions and what they said about war and conflict, it was of particular interest when I came across Islam and what they said. And this is one passage in the Quran that says, permission to fight is given to those against whom war is made because they have been wronged. Those who have been driven out from their homes unjustly only because they said our Lord is God. And if God did not repel them by means of others, there would surely have been pulled down temples and churches and synagogues and mosques. So definitively, Islam says that a, a, a war is sanctioned for defensive purposes only. And that it's not only for the purpose of protecting um, your religion, Islam, but also the religions of other people. So it's incumbent upon all Muslims to protect um, and defend against any oppression or aggression against any religious institutions, be they Christian, Jews, Muslims, or, or whatever. So as I, as I, uh, where did I put in my picture?
also as I um, searched more, I discovered that not only was the concept of war addressed in the Quran, but the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad, peace be upon him, also taught his followers about this as well. Um, I also discovered that Muhammad was, among many things, a commander of armies. Um, he was sent by God, as a, in our belief, as the final messenger for all times, for all mankind. So he had to be a complete messenger. So there's examples for us on how to be a good parent, a husband, a son, a brother, a businessman, a student, a teacher, and yes, as a warrior as well. So all of this was in addition to how we should worship God through prayer and fasting and reflection. Uh, conflict being an inescapable part of humanity, Islam came to put limits and controls on it. Um, there are, of course, many things about uh, uh, conflict that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught. But I wanted to share with you these five, these ten commands that he gave to his soldiers before engaging in combat. And he said, do not harm women, children, elderly, or the sick. Do not commit treachery and never mutilate or disfigure. Do not uproot, cut down, or burn trees. Do not harm any livestock except for food. In combat, avoid striking the face, for God created all of us in the image of Prophet Adam. Do not kill monks in monasteries, and do not kill those sitting in places of worship. Do not destroy the villages and towns. Do not spoil the cultivated fields and gardens. Do not, in, do not wish for an encounter with the enemy, but when you are forced to encounter them, exercise patience. No one may punish with fire except the Creator. So like weapons of mass destruction, chemical weapons, nuclear, all of those will be prohibited in Islam. And finally, accustom yourself to do good if people do good, and do not do wrong even if they commit wrongs. So the significance of these commands really are, are in my mind, are, are two. One is that because Muslims believe that the source of these commands through Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, were from God, they're non-negotiable. They're non-negotiable. So, whereas any just war concepts that we've applied and learned through the Nuremberg trials, through the Geneva Conventions, and the history of, of, of combat, they're all negotiable because they're, they're, they're within the domain of, of human intellect. Whereas stuff that's being told to us from our, our prophet, they're not negotiable. The second important thing is that these rules laid out 1,400 years ago uh, and others that I've read are even more strict and more humane than the collective body of just war concepts that we've, we've uh, accumulated. Okay, so jihad. Jihad, the, the term jihad in Arabic does not in and of itself have anything to do with war or conflict. The foundational meaning of jihad is to make an effort or exert oneself in the way of God. So, for example, filial piety, being good to your parents, that is jihad. It's such a noble concept that parents in the Muslim world name their children jihad. Military combat uh, is not the, the, the primary aspect of jihad, is, is, the, is the big point. It's important to note that, that jihad is not holy war, um, as commonly referred. Muslims do not regard war as holy. They, rather, they regard war as a means and not an end in itself. It's a means to durable and durable uh, peace and stability. Uh, when war is necessary, of course, you know Islam puts severe limitations on how to how to conduct war. And there's a concept called the greater jihad and the lesser jihad. Greater jihad is, as I mentioned, the struggle to improve one's own character. So, for example. Um, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, the best jihad is to speak truth to a tyrannical leader. Another example is when a man came to him and asked him permission to join the military, the Prophet Muhammad responded, perform jihad by serving your parents. Okay, so that's a greater jihad. The lesser jihad is defensive fighting um, uh, and, and religious conversion, territorial conquest, political power are not sanctioned reason for combat. It's for defensive purposes only, as I mentioned. Um, all Muslims are required to engage in the greater jihad, the self-struggle to improve your character. But only some Muslims are required to participate in the lesser jihad, which is a military uh, combat. And you have to be a certain age, you can't be the only child, you know, there's certain criteria for you to uh, be a part of an army. Okay, there you go, ISIS. Um, 
so ISIS, they're they're basically vigilantes in the in the view of of, of Muslims. They're, they're, when when we invaded Iraq and then combined with the civil war in Syria, you know the the invasion of Iraq by our military was one where we completely removed their military, security, political, judicial apparatus. We left a massive power vacuum. And it was quickly filled by uh, what we call terrorist groups. In this case, ISIS. It would be no different. It would be the functional equivalent if a foreign power came to our country, invaded our country, got rid of our police, police and our military, and our political system, and then left. Who do you think would fill that power vacuum? The Mississippi militia, because they would be armed and organized, and somebody overseas would call them terrorists. So. They're vigilantes, in our view. There's no, they're not religiously sanctioned. And if you study the, the, the mission or the goal of, of ISIS, they're, they're political in nature and certainly not religious in nature. Um, so the, the way to look at it is, it's kind of a jingoistic, but the KKK is the Christians, what ISIS is to Muslims. Christians don't sanction what KKK, but they you know, spout off religious reasons. Nobody pays attention to that, right? Similarly, same thing for ISIS. ISIS kills more Muslims than they do any other religious groups. So. All right, that's it. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I'm just going to jump right into my talk because I see the time is um, flying by. But before uh, I begin, I did want to thank everyone for coming out today because we're really eager to share. Um, how we practice our faith, how we live it, what we teach our children. And there'd be no point in putting a panel together if nobody was interested in actually coming out and listening to what we have to say. So thank you for coming out on a Saturday afternoon. So my role today is to talk about some of the most common stereotypes that I get asked about when we do interfaith discussions. And there's a whole range of questions we get asked about, but there's two common ones that come up time and time again. During Q&A, if there are other questions that people are wondering about, we'll be more than happy to address those at that time. So I'm going to start out with sharing a little incident that happened in a church in Danville where we were taking questions from the audience and a little old lady stood up and came to the microphone and with a quavering voice she said that she was really, really upset to know that Sharia had come to this country and that Sharia had taken over the, the land and the courts and that judges were now deciding cases based on the sacred law of another religious tradition and she, you know, wanted to know more about that. And it was obvious that her fear was very, very real um, and she needed to be appeased. And that's probably a very common myth out there that Sharia is um, here and it's taking over America. So if you were to regularly watch certain evening news programs, it would be natural to believe the propaganda that Muslims, who are today's boogeymen, after all, are here to take over the land with their different way of living and believing, but actually nothing could be farther from the truth. So to start off with, what exactly is Sharia? The word Sharia means the way or the path to God. It refers to the very idea of God communicating with human beings through revelation. And Sharia is, simply put, a moral code. Before it's a legal code, it's a moral code. It contains rules for behavior for Muslims, similar to how rabbinical or Talmudic law derives kosher dietary rules and restrictions. And it's not so much a codified rule book, nor is it merely a set of higher principles. Muslims actually see Sharia as the ongoing search for God's prescription for human action, for human conduct, one of the three dimensions that Dr. Asad had told us about. So Sharia should first be understood by its goals and its values before any of its specific rules. Sharia is more concerned with sin than it is with crime. So, for example, if I were to gossip and backbite with one of my friends about another friend, there's no earthly law that's going to hold me accountable for that behavior. But I do know that I will be held accountable by God on the Day of Judgment if I don't repent and change my ways. And it's Sharia that tells me that I'm actually prohibited 
from slandering another person. So we worship God with our minds, our bodies, and our souls, faith, conduct, and character. And Sharia is concerned with everything to do with our conduct, with the physical aspects of life. It defines all the aspects of a Muslim's actions and behavior. And it dictates everything from what we eat, to how we dress, to how we worship, to the rules of marriage and divorce, the rules of financial transactions and inheritance, the rules of what is required of us and what is forbidden. And the entire Sharia is designed to protect human welfare, which Muslims define through six core universal interests. And next time I promise I'm going to have a PowerPoint presentation as well, but just bear with me. So the six core universal interests that all of Sharia protects. So any Sharia rule that you hear about, if you reflect, it will be protecting one of these six rights. The first one, oh, louder, sorry. Uh, the first one, I keep thinking this is a mic that everyone can hear, but okay. Uh, so the first one is the right to religion. You can't force anyone to convert to any other faith tradition. The second is the right to life. You can't kill anyone unjustly. The third is the right to family and lineage. Everyone has the right to know where they come from. The fact that Muslims are taught that sexual relations are confined to marriage isn't just because of some divine decree, it's to protect family bonds. The fourth is the right to honor and dignity. We can't lie or slander or backbite about other people. So tabloid journalism would be completely out for someone who follows Sharia. <laughs> the right to intellect and reason. So practicing Muslims know that intoxicants are prohibited for them. So we don't indulge in alcohol or recreational drugs. But Sharia is nuanced. It's not just black and white. There are gray areas as well. So for example, anesthesia in times of surgery affects our ability to reason and to make moral decisions, but anesthesia has its own rules and exceptions. And then the sixth core universal interest that Sharia protects is the right to property and wealth. So we can't steal or usurp or cheat anyone out of what's rightfully theirs. Now Muslim jurists discovered these Sharia rules through four primary sources. The first is the Holy Quran, which is our revealed book, our scripture. The second are the words and actions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The third is universal agreement amongst Muslim scholars or the Muslim community on any given issue. And the fourth is careful use of analogy. Now, one thing people may not realize is that Islam does not allow for anarchy or chaos. We have to have some form of government in place and we have to live under it even if it's not a Muslim one. And we are required to respect and obey the laws of the land. In fact, I once learned from a Muslim scholar that if we deliberately, if we ever deliberately run a red light while driving, we need to ask God for his forgiveness because we broke a law that we had promised to follow. And that's just one example of how religion informs our day-to-day -day actions. Now, Sharia tells us that if we can't practice our religion in peace and safety, and if we aren't happy with the laws of the land, then we need to migrate from that land. And the highest law of the land in the United States is the Constitution. So according to the Muslims' own Sharia, we are required to respect the Constitution. And if we don't, we're supposed to leave. And believe you me, with everything that's going on in the political landscape right now, there is probably no one more concerned about protecting the Constitution than your fellow Muslim Americans. So what about penal code punishments? That's the elephant in the room. That's what people think about when they hear the word Sharia. Beheadings, cutting off of hands, whippings, stonings. Yes, there is a penal code within the Sharia. Just like the United States law has capital punishment for certain offenses, Sharia law also includes a form of capital punishment. But the important differences between capital punishment in American law and capital punishment in Sharia law are two. First, the penal code is first and foremost meant as a deterrent. It's not actually meant to be implemented. And the second, 
is that the evidence required to establish proof of a punishable crime makes the punishment almost impossible to implement. For example, the penal code for adultery is death. However, the evidence required to prove adultery is four witnesses who actually witnessed the act. So as you can see, the punishment is there, but it is first and foremost meant as a deterrent. It is meant to illustrate to human beings the enormity of the sin in God's eyes. And it is meant to ensure that these types of crimes or sins that affect society at large are not being done out in the open and are not becoming the norm. Now, if we want to look at how Sharia is implemented, we can look at the Ottoman Empire, which was the last legitimate Muslim government that ruled a large portion of the world for almost 700 years. The punishment for adultery during that time, all 700 years, was only implemented once. And even after that one time, the scholars protested it, and so it ended up never being repeated again. The other very important fact for people to understand is that according to Sharia itself, the laws of Sharia can only be applied and upheld when there is a legitimate Muslim government in power. And a majority of Muslim scholars today are in agreement that no such government currently exists in the world today. And therefore, there's no official body which has the authority to implement the penal code punishments, which, by the way, only make up 0.1% of the body of Sharia law. Unfortunately, when one hears the word Sharia, they just only imagine the grisly capital punishments. Now, when you see those horrific images on the internet or hear stories of those types of punishments, you should know that Muslims consider that to be vigilantism. It's in no way sanctioned in Islam, and it's actually forbidden by our scholars and our jurists. And when you see isolated rulings being implemented by certain governments around the world, you should know that they don't represent the meaning and the spirit of Sharia itself. And just like any other community, you're going to find the whole spectrum of practice and adherence to the rules of the faith, even amongst Muslims. And so you'll find people who, out of personal conviction here in the United States, will stick with the rules of Sharia in their lives. And then you'll find people who don't even know much about what the basic rulings are. But they still consider themselves to be Muslims, and they are, as long as they believe in the testimony of faith, which Dr. S. had told us about, believing in one God and believing in the authenticity of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Okay, so moving on to the second myth. Women are oppressed in Islam. Yes, just like anywhere else in the world, there are some Muslim women who are oppressed, and some Muslim-majority countries do have a culture that is favorable to men, and there are stories of domestic abuse in some Muslim households. But the real question we should be asking ourselves is, does Islam teach, condone, or in any way support the oppression of women? And the answer is absolutely not. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, the best of you are the ones who are the best to their women. The majority of the focus of his last sermon was on the rights of women. Muslims believe in the story of Adam and Eve, but in Islam, Eve is not held accountable for Adam's mistakes. They are both held equally responsible. She is not the one to blame. She isn't considered to be a temptress, nor is she viewed as the reason mankind lost paradise. So there seem to be a few reasons that Islam gets this bad rap. The first one is probably the hijab, the head covering. It gets translated as headscarf, but hijab actually doesn't mean headscarf. It's fine, however, to use that as a shorthand now. Hijab actually means barrier and it sets up boundaries for interactions between men and women. It's the first thing people see, and they don't understand it. And they don't necessarily think of the Virgin Mary when they see the headscarf. They usually wonder, why do men have to wear it? Uh, why do women have to wear it, and men don't? Muslim men also have parts of their bodies that they have to cover, according to Sharia. 
they must cover from navel to the knee. So they can't show their kneecaps or their belly buttons, not allowed to wear Speedos. <laughs> so why the different rules? Well, we have different rules here in America as well. Uh, if a man and a woman were out jogging in the park on a hot day and they got sweaty and uncomfortable, the man could take off his top and continue running bare-chested. If the woman did the same thing, she'd be arrested for public indecency. Why? Why the different standards? Why the different rules? We believe that the rules for how we dress are divinely inspired and that God understands what is best for us since He is our Creator after all. The second thing people see visually is if they were to visit one of our mosques or if they saw the Muslims praying in a congregation, they would see that the women are praying behind the men. And oftentimes people bring to mind the framework of Rosa Parks. They think, you know, the way Rosa Parks was pushed to the back of the bus because she was considered a second-class citizen. So must, must be the case with the Muslim women as well. The truth is that where you pray in the congregation doesn't ha give any indication of your closeness to God. Islam gives both men and women equal access to getting to God, to getting to paradise, to getting to his divine pleasure. If you were to see us in our congregational prayers, you would see that our prayer is actually very intimate. We stand close together, shoulder to shoulder. We stand, we bow, we prostrate on the ground with our foreheads on the floor and our bottoms up in the air. And most women, especially Muslim women, would not be comfortable being in that kind of vulnerable position with a man behind them. So really where the women are praying in the congregation has to do more about privacy and modesty and being able to focus on our relationship with God and not worrying about whom we're standing next to or in front of or behind. Okay, and the third uh, reason that people often think that women must be oppressed in Islam is people often confuse how women are treated in countries like Saudi Arabia with how Islam treats women in general. So the two holiest cities in Islam, Mecca and Medina, happen to be in the land that is currently called Saudi Arabia. However, Saudi Arabia does not hold religious authority over the world's population of Muslims. Saudi Arabia is not for Muslims, what the Vatican is for the Catholics. Their government can make whatever laws they want to, but that doesn't give them legitimacy over the world's population of Muslims. The fact that women only just started driving in 2018 is due to a Saudi law. I've had people ask me, how can you be part of a religion that doesn't allow you to drive? I'm not part of a religion that doesn't allow me to drive. <laughs> so. Muslim women have been heads of state in Muslim-majority countries. One of the current vice presidents of Iran is a woman. Even in America, women have not managed to shatter that glass ceiling yet, but who knows, things might be changing soon. There's hope. And um, so those are the two myths I wanted to cover, and if there are any others, we can tackle them during Q&A. Thank you so much for your time.